This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this week's episode, where my guest is Alan Heeks, former corporate world inhabitant, organic farmer, coach, and author of the book Natural Happiness. After his transition into organic farming, Alan realised that, quote, a cultivated organic system is a profound guide to tend in human nature and that organic growth methods have parallels for people, such as composting your stress and using crop rotation to avoid burnout. Listen on as we explore this idea further. I still find it really quite surprising that I'm, I'm sort of writing about how to use organic gardening as a sort of guide to human nature. Uh, you know, I grew up in towns, never had much interest in, in gardening, and I had quite a successful business career until the age of 42, at which point I was getting kind of burned out and quite disillusioned about the big business world. And I had this sort of crazy idea of starting an organic farm as an education centre where young people could kind of find their roots and get a sense of direction as they tried to make sense of adult life. And this idea wouldn't go away. And eventually I thought, maybe I'm supposed to do this. I, I mean, I think the idea was great, but the idea of me doing it was just unbelievable because I had absolutely no experience of farming, education, young people. However, I dropped out of my business career, took the plunge and started this organic farm and educational charity. Uh, And amazingly, it's still going strong. I think one of the the sort of funny things for me about this was that what I hadn't realised was that I was in huge need of an education myself. So moving from sort of the business world where I was trained to, you know, make things happen and take control into organic farming where you can't actually impose control at all was a massive education and i started to realize that the way that you have to kind of work with the natural organism of an organic garden or an organic farm was an incredible guide to how to sort of work with your own well-being or work with other people or human situations and that's really where the roots of the book lie Brilliant. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you write in the book about how you found yourself through the land and that people found you more measured and more mature after you'd spent some time with the land. Can you talk about that and how that came about, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because until I got involved with the organic farm, I hadn't realised how artificial and superficial regular mainstream agriculture is you know the 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 plants don't really grow out of the soil they grow based on you know chemicals and you need artificial suppressants to deal with the problems and looking back you could say in some ways my business career was a bit the same you know it was a kind of superficial version of me i think i was driven along by sort of an ego that wanted to get recognition and achieve things so in a way getting really deeply engaged with an organic ecosystem started to kind of reflect through in in my own kind of human nature. I mean, these days, I think I'm quite careful about my own health. And it's because I realise that, you know, I'm quite a delicate ecosystem, just like a garden is or a farm is. And in all three cases, you actually need to really observe carefully. You need clean, healthy, sustainable inputs. And you need to be very careful that you just kind of go with the grain of the situation instead of imposing something on it. I'm involved in horticultural therapy and after I left a job in London I turned to gardening and found that as a very useful way to sort of process things and and deal with my own mental health so I'm a big advocate for it however there's part of me that thinks can we stretch this metaphor too far and I'm kicking around this idea of a lot of people coming to gardening as a second career at a certain time of their lives or maybe they've come from a, a particular background Is it an age thing? Could it just as likely be pottery that was somebody's salvation, you know, or is there something specifically unique about gardening or farming? Well, I think there is. I mean, I think one of the sort of upsides of COVID was a lot of people realised that it was good to be outdoors for their well-being. But what I feel that my book does is show people how to actually connect with nature a lot more deeply and to really learn through parallels with nature. And I mean, since I started with these ideas over 20 years ago. I've led workshops for several thousand people. And what I do find, you know, when you say stretching it too far, actually people really get it because it's it's not like some sort of new age theory. This is about real things like seeds, composting, mulching, 
and people do get that there are parallels that just as in an organic system you compost the waste as your main source of growth that actually people can compost their difficult emotions or their anxious thoughts into a source of energy people really get that idea i think there is something about the whole sort of bigger picture of life and the universe that you can examine through the lens of a garden I'm not going to ask you to give too much away about your book because people will have to read it if they're interested in the processes. Yeah. But can you talk about the seven seeds of natural happiness that you mentioned early on in the book? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that was quite funny was I started this organic farm and educational charity back in 1990. And, you know, it was really quite stressful at first because I clearly didn't know what I was doing. I had to sort of find people who could help me to, to make it work. And I was doing that for half of my time. The other half of my time I was doing training for workplace groups and so on and it was actually seven years in that i had this light bulb moment where i thought hang on you know the organic farm is actually the model i need to guide the work i'm doing with training for people so that was the stage at which i i really began to use the model does that sort of start to answer your question it definitely does and the other question that i had leading on from that was i think again that you like and well be into a garden and i wondered if you could yes. just talk about that for a bit yeah well i think for a start the basic idea of treating yourself or a sort of human community group like a garden or an ecosystem needs cultivating with respect for sort of organic principles is quite important and going back to what you said about the seven seeds I mean, what I started to do once I realized that this was a very powerful model was to think quite carefully about what are the basic principles of organic cultivation and then start to map those across to how you could apply those to human nature. And in the book, the first sort of three seeds are really about well-being. So this is about things like composting stress, using crop rotation to avoid burnout, how you can apply the idea of mulching to your own sort of well-being. And then the fourth seed is really about the skills that organic gardeners and farmers use. And I call that co-creativity. You know, coming from a business background, I think one of the benefits I had was I was really observing what organic cultivators do. And I was hugely impressed because I think that organic gardeners and farmers have tremendous quality of observation. They need a lot of patience. They need a lot of creativity because they have to sort of invent ways of working with the reality of the situation instead of just zapping it with a chemical system. And then in the latter seven seeds are really how you start to apply all that out in the human world. So the next chapter is around how all this works in terms of communities. Then there's a chapter about facing into climate change. And then there's the last chapter is about how you can really draw on the kind of inspirational level through nature in order to kind of help you sort of cope with all the stresses of everyday human life. So would you go as far as to say to people, ditch the corporate career and jump into a career in farming or gardening? Or is it more about <laughs> taking the principles and applying them in your life? No, it's very much about the principles. I mean, the new book, Natural Happiness, is actually my fourth published book. The first one was using the same model back in 2000. And at that point, because I was actually working quite a lot as a trainer in the corporate world, I had this sort of strap line. I said that really... Big work organisations are like the battery chicken farms of you know, the human world. And I still think that there's a really big parallel between environmental sustainability and human sustainability. So I think I was simply ahead of my time. I, I've recently been doing some training using the Natural Happiness Seven Seeds with management coaches, and they absolutely loved it. And, you know, my first book back in 2000, they said, this is brilliant. You know, it's just up our street. So... No, I wouldn't urge everybody to ditch their corporate career. I, I think that you need a lot of skill and capability to survive in the world of big organisations, whether they're business organisations or charities, public sector, whatever. But I do think that the seven seeds of natural happiness can help you to do that. So would you say that gardeners maybe have a natural advantage when it comes to processing their own stuff if they already understand how the natural world works? I think they do, but one of the main target audiences that I'm hoping to reach through this book is actually gardeners. You know, we know that there's a huge number of people in the UK who do garden, but we also know there are a huge number of people who are suffering from stress, that life is getting you know, more complicated and worrying for all of us. So my hope is that people who don't really sort of go for self-help books, but are kind of trying to make sense of how they look after themselves better, 
how they kind of you know relate to the climate crisis more positively this would be a book for them you know for gardeners it's starting with things they're very familiar with you know processes like mulching composting etc but actually showing them how things they're quite familiar with can actually translate over into the human world yeah so it's about connecting the dots i wonder actually as gardeners how much subconsciously we do to kind of almost self-medicate through our actions in the garden well that's a very interesting point i mean I'm not aware of any proper surveys that look at the stress levels of gardeners compared to the general population. But I think you and I would both reckon that gardeners are generally somewhat less stressed than average. But my feeling, you know, when I think about how life has changed in the last sort of, 10 or 15 years, for most people, I think it's got way more stressful. We're all spending hours and hours on screens, smartphones, etc. And there is research that shows that that makes it very hard for us to relax very hard for us to kind of focus calmly and steadily on something. I think gardening is a really good antidote, but also feel like there are a lot of gardeners who are, you know, the gardening alone isn't enough to manage the stress levels they have to deal with. And that's why I think this book could really help them to sort of build on the gardening skills they've already got. Yeah, and put things into perspective, I guess. So you mentioned stress and sort of short attention span there. Are there any common problems that you see sort of presenting again and again in your work that are particularly well suited to this kind of way of looking at things? Yeah, there's a very good book that I mentioned in my book called Your Brain on Nature, which was written by two doctors at the Harvard Medical School. And this basically gathers together quite a lot of research in recent years about what effect all these hours and hours on screens is having on us. And they talk about something called directed attention fatigue. What they mean by that is that because we're spending so much time focusing our attention on screens, we're also hopping from one message to another to another. Actually, it makes us very hard for us to slow down. It makes it hard for us to relax and sleep properly. and also makes it hard for us to just think our way slowly, calmly through a major problem because our brain's always hopping around to the next social media message. But then they go on to say that the best antidote to screen time is actually being out in nature, you know, being out in a garden. And they talk about what they call fascination. They say the benefit of being out in a garden or, you know, in the countryside is that the landscape starts to draw your attention outwards and relax you. And that's partly what I try and build on in the book. Yeah, that sounds like a very good book. And to my shame, I haven't read it and I will be getting a copy of it. So again, without giving sort of too much away or or going into the finer bones of it, but you talk about in the book a personal energy audit and that kind of struck a chord and I found that really interesting. Can you give an overview of that? Yeah, I can. So one of the things I've tried to do with this book is to look at parallels between environmental sustainability and human sustainability. And I think that's a fairly new idea. I think most of us understand that there are big issues around the way that we treat the environment is unsustainable. So professionals, when they're assessing environmental sustainability, do use energy audits. They they look at how any particular process, you know, the energy it draws in, the energy it puts out and the, the processes it uses. So I basically dreamed up this idea of a personal energy audit. And what it does is it looks at four categories of energy, physical, emotional energy, mental energy, and what I've called inspirational energy. For each one, it it asks us to sort of rate on an estimate of one to 10, how big an energy input do we get on several kinds of energy within each of those categories? And then where's the energy going out? And to give you an example of the sort of thing that people get from that, I've used this a lot with people in work teams. And very commonly what they find is that a lot of their energy is coming from their friends and their family and that their work is a net energy deficit i.e. they're putting more energy into their work than they're getting back out of it. You know, it's demanding a lot from them. It's not giving them as much satisfaction as they want. And people have found that a really helpful wake-up call. You know, say, well, this isn't sustainable. This isn't healthy that, you know, I'm actually depending on my family and friends to kind of fill the energy deficit. And if you do feel that, then what I also explore in the book is ways to actually harness natural energy sources for people which mean that hopefully you're not actually losing energy in the way that you do your work. And if people are listening, and a lot of people will listen in their gardens, can you maybe suggest like a really quick exercise they could do that might be helpful if they're in that particular environment? Yeah. So in the first chapter of the book, which is called Nourish Your Roots, one of the basic exercises that I do in my workshops and which it's all written up in the book and you could do it easily in your garden, 
is what I call the tree talk. So ideally you would do this with a tree. So, you know, in, if you've got an apple tree or a, an ash tree or whatever in your garden and you can do this with a physical tree, that's ideal. If you can't, I mean, you could do this indoors, you could imagine it. But the basic exercise is that you imagine you're with a tree or you're physically kind of standing, leaning with a tree. And then you start to imagine that you are a tree yourself. And what I mean by that is imagine that you've got roots that spread out under the ground and that your roots are doing the same as a physical tree's roots, which is your roots are giving you nourishment and resources and are also giving you stability so that you can stand firm in the storms. So I ask people to imagine, are their root systems big enough and stable enough that they're getting all the resources coming in that they need? Then I start to ask them to imagine that they've got a trunk just like a tree trunk and whether their trunk has the right balance of strength and flexibility so that it can sort of stand tall, but it can bend with the winds. And also that you could say that the trunk of a tree is where it processes its incoming resources to create its outputs. So I'm asking people to assess whether their trunk is kind of processing energy and resources effectively. Then I ask them to imagine they've got a branch network high above their head, just the way the tree would spreading out. And to imagine that their branches is where they produce their outputs. So, you know, for a tree, this is the fruit, the nuts, the berries, the blossoms. So for a person, you know, what are your outputs? How big is your branch network? And then the key thing to wrap this up is to look at the balance, particularly the balance between the roots and the branches. So very often people say, OK, actually, my branch network is too big in relation to my root network. And I said, well, OK, now imagine this is a, an apple tree in your own garden. And as a gardener, you'd know that the main ways you can balance it are firstly by feeding the roots some more or secondly, by pruning the branches back or a mixture of the two. And people find that really helpful as a very simple physical way of assessing whether their their kind of energy system is in balance. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really a good exercise. And you mentioned before about the climate crisis, which does obviously factor quite large in your work. Is that important for you? And is that a kind of bigger picture thing as well? It is. I, I mean, I've been quite deeply involved in work on the climate change for probably about 10 years. And I have to admit in the last sort of three or four years, you know, it's something that really worries me a lot. So I'm trying to figure out not only what I can do in my own life, but my impression is that the majority of people do know there's a climate crisis, but they find it absolutely overwhelming and bewildering and they just can't really engage with it. So one of my hopes with this book is that it, it actually gives people the ability to sort of face into the climate crisis, to handle their own kind of distress and overwhelm, but also to see what they could do positively. And that's why the first chapters of Natural Happiness are really about looking after yourself using these gardening analogies to kind of deepen your own roots and strengthen your resilience and then to use all that to start to look at the bigger picture around you like the climate crisis and to see how you live with it and what you can do constructively about it. Yeah which I think you do very much through your work and I was going to ask you you know about resilience in communities and why that's important and I think maybe that's something that we do neglect quite a lot you know, when we're looking at our own well-being, that we can overlook yeah. the whole thing that we're just basically knitted together and we need to re-establish links. You know, how important is that for you? I think it's absolutely crucial. And my feeling is that over the last, say, you know, 30 years, our society has become much more individualistic. I would take this back to Margaret Thatcher because you may remember that Margaret Thatcher was absolutely preoccupied with the wealth of the individual household and really didn't think community had much to do with anything. What I see when I look over the next, say, five to 10 years ahead of us is that we're all facing massive challenges. And I think the scale of those is such that you can't simply get through those as an individual household. We're going to have to support each other and share resources. We're going to have to look out for each other sort of emotionally as well as practically. I mean, to give you an example of that, quite a lot of the work I've been doing in the last sort of three or four years has been around what's sometimes called food security. So this is looking at, you know, where is our food coming from and are our food supplies under threat? And we've already seen quite a few times when supermarkets have literally run out of food for a week or two. We've seen big price increases in various foods over the last three or four years. And the experts that I work with say there's a lot more of that to come. 
So to me, there's the two big priorities, you know, for, for your listeners, I would say the two things I would look at are strengthening the face to face community around you where you live. And linking to that is looking at how you can improve the availability of local food. So things like, you know, community market gardens, community supported agriculture, having a sort of like a village hall where you could sort of cook shared meals if the food supplies get short. Those are the sort of practical things that I, I think we all need to be looking at. Yeah, I have to say, the more I work in the job that I do, the more I kind of delve into the whole idea of horticulture and well-being and all the rest of it. I think food is really the glue because we all eat, we all need nutrition, and it just seems to be a perfect arena to rebuild those social connections. But aside from that, and this is a big mm. question, and you know, it's, it's obviously going to be your opinion on it, but nature does seem to provide this arena for things like reflection and self-improvement why is it so good for that well it's a good question it definitely provides it i think one of the reasons it's so important now is that when i think about again the way life has changed in the last 10 or 15 years with social media and fake news it's very easy to think that human reality is the only reality and to get very carried along by what you know, the social media tell us, you know, which is usually that we're not good enough, that we're missing something. And we need to go out there and buy something in order to feel better, which, you know, really is not the way to live. If you start to connect with nature and to realize that, you know, we're part of nature and that there is wisdom in nature as well as in people. In fact, Frank, there's probably more wisdom at the moment in nature than there is in people. So it's, I think nature is just the best antidote to some of the craziness in the human world at the moment. Yeah, very well said. And I don't normally ask an author this, but I think that you have this wealth of knowledge and you mentioned your brain on nature. Are there any other good books that you might point people in the direction of? Yeah. Um, so if people are up for sort of thinking more about climate change and how to kind of live with it, the best book I recommend, apart from my own book, is a book called Active Hope, written by Chris Johnston and Joanna Macy, which is a very easily readable way into understanding the bigger picture of what's going on but also some very good process about how to deal with a sense of being overwhelmed and bewildered and kind of work through that so that you start to sort of look at the situation more constructively and see that there is actually a lot that we can do both individually but also very much as communities i think the one other thing i'd add and this is a little bit risky to say but one of the main people that I've worked with to try and understand the climate crisis, a, a guy called Jem Bendel, who came up with an approach he called deep adaptation. He says that he believes that fundamentally the climate crisis is actually a spiritual crisis. And what he means by that is that it's so major that actually we all have to question what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life when it's under threat in such a big way? And that's again for me part of what i get from nature is that sense of connection with a bigger picture so when i'm feeling overwhelmed actually getting back out into nature and probably doing a bit of gardening starts to give me a sense of all right go back to basics go back to your roots go back to what you are here for but i'm mentioning it because that's what the last chapter of the book is all about is how to sort of draw on inspiration as a way of getting more direction and more of a kind of steady center when there's a lot of turbulence and confusion in the world. Thank you very much to Alan for a great interview and thank you for listening. If you like this interview, I recommend checking out episode 54 with Stefan Batoris, which was released on the 2nd of July 2019 and is all about forest bathing. And episode 205 with Kendra Wilson, which was released on the 29th of August 2022 and is about gardening for the senses. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. 